Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are times in my son's life that I feel like an absolute killjoy. He'll be happily playing without any regard to his schedule or schoolwork or responsibilities. And I, in the midst of this utter delight that he has, have to intervene and ruin his day. Or so it feels. Jonathan, buddy, it's time to practice your piano. Jonathan, buddy, it's time to revise your spelling for tomorrow. Now, who doesn't want to only bring good news, right? I sure prefer to be the one who, the parent who only says, buddy, let's go to the park. Let's get some ice cream. But no, out of love for him, I have to ruin his day. Now, the scripture passage that we've just heard read from Amos has the potential to ruin our day. Amos was an 8th century BC prophet of Israel. His name is derived from a Hebrew verb meaning to carry a load. And his message to Israel was indeed a heavy load for them to bear. Giving bad news is never enjoyable. It is also not easy to tell people that they have failed to meet God's expectations and will not enjoy his blessing. How does one break the news to religious people that their worship does not please God? How would Amos tell the people of God that their worship and everything that they've put into it stinks? More importantly, why? And what does this have to do with the Methodist emphasis on social justice? Well, church, I confess, I have written about three versions of this sermon because this text is so stuck and in your face. But let's press in to hear what God has to say to us as a church. In verses 18 to 20, Amos begins on a note of mourning. The translation that we've heard read begins with the words, Woe to you! which is a powerful statement because this phrase is most commonly found in laments for the dead. Amos begins his argument by essentially suggesting that those who are hearing this message are already dead. And what does he go on to say? Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Amos was the first prophet to refer to this term, the day of the Lord. Now, the expression originated in Israel's holy war traditions and was strongly associated with the idea that God fought for Israel against her enemies. The day of the Lord was a day of deliverance. Israel's faith in God was rooted in God's commitment to their safety. They commemorated His mighty works of old and they continued to expect God's aid in the future. Their desire then for the day of the Lord is thoroughly natural. The people eagerly awaited the coming day of the Lord, the one who had saved them so many times in the past. When the Lord's day arrives, they thought, it will be a day of great victory, of rejoicing, of vindication, and of light. But Amos asks, why should you desire this day? For you, Amos says, the day will be darkness, not light. Now, most of us are eagerly anticipating the day when a COVID-19 vaccine will be announced. We long for that day, that discovery. For us, that day will be a day of rejoicing and things finally beginning to fall back in place to what they used to be. Imagine being told, why should you desire that day? For you, that day will be a sorrow, not as light. Amos has not only ruined their day, he has ruined for them the day of the Lord. And he continues to flesh out his concern in verse 19. He presents a vivid picture of a man escaping one danger, a lion, only to be met by another, a bear. And then finally reaching the safety of his house where he is bit by a snake. We can almost see the man panting with relief as he steadies himself against the wall, 
But instead of reaching safety, his world goes dark. And so it will be for the Israelites. Instead of the anticipated brightness of God's appearing, there will only be darkness. It will not be a day of deliverance, but disaster. In other words, you, Israel, are the enemies that God will vanquish. Darkness and gloom is the only shape of their future. There is no escape. For these people, then, there would appear to be no hope, no life, no gospel. Now, church, as far as day ruining goes, I think you agree Amos has got 10 upon 10. But why? What has led God to deliver such a terrifying judgment on his people? Let's find out what kind of people they were. I'm reading to you from Amos chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. That's from Amos 4, verses 4 and 5. Now, in the verses I've just read, Amos mentions two major shrines, Bethel and Gilgal. Bethel is the site of Abram's altar, Jacob's ladder, Rachel's death, Deborah's judgment seat, the prophetic perch, and command and control center. It's also the place where Saul went to seek Samuel, since Bethel and Gilgal were both part of Samuel's administrative circuit. Gilgal is the place where Joshua parted the waters of the Jordan River, just as Moses had parted the rivers, the waters of the Red Sea. It is where the wilderness folk paused for Passover, where Samuel and God abandoned Saul and rejected his kingship. It is the place where Elisha turned poisoned toadstools into mushrooms, harmless mushrooms. Now, in other words, these were major sites in Israel's history. They were places of worship. God said, bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and proclaim free will offerings. For so you love to do, O people of Israel. The people of Israel were skilled worshippers. They were seasoned, regular worshippers. They are the kind of people who, have, who would have found this current COVID-19 pandemic unbearable. Unable to come to church. Unable to worship God in church. They would have absolutely hated it. Their lives revolved around going to these hallowed places of worship, offering their sacrifices to God, especially during their high holy days. But what does God have to say? To such people. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. These are direct quotes that Amos is speaking on behalf of God. He begins with two verbs, I hate, I despise, and continues with four more negated verbs. I take no delight in, is literally in Hebrew, I don't like the smell of. That's what it means, literally. After I will not accept, the next two verbs express God's reaction. I will not look upon them. I will not listen. Now, taken together, these statements make clear that the Lord's rejection of the people's worship is complete, is total. The Lord does not like the smell, the sight, the sound of what is happening when Israel worships Him. Now, after this general announcement of rejection, the prophet goes on to list seven aspects of Israel's worship, all of which are rejected. I'm very quickly going to name them. One, the feasts, the great Feasts, the three yearly festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. Two, the solemn assemblies, which are worship gatherings. 
Three, burnt offerings in which the entire animal is consumed in flames and thus ascends to heaven. Four, grain offerings, which are gifts of grain. Five, the peace offering, which was accompanied by a sacred meal in which parts of the animal offered were eaten. And six and seven, the noise and the melody refers to singing, instrumental music, and all the sounds emanating from a place so busy with the activity of worship. Now, if the earlier verbs made clear that the Lord had totally rejected the worship of the people, the listing of the seven aspects of worship indicates that the Lord rejects completely all that was going on at the shrines, since seven is the biblical number for completion. I wonder if you're beginning to squirm in your seats. I know I struggled with this passage immensely as I prepared to preach it this morning. You see, this period of time has been an incredibly busy time and straining period for the whole church. Everyone, from the pastors to the church office, administrative team to the lay leaders to the LCEC to cell leaders to the worship team to the AV crew to the hospitality team to the cleaners and the security guards and more all have been doing back-breaking work day after day just so that we can continue to worship God together online and so that now beginning this weekend we, we start the pilot for the MCCY project so that 100 100 members of our church can come together and partake Holy Communion together. I imagined this week as I fought and wrestled with this passage, God telling us, I hate, I despise your feasts and assemblies. All your sacrifices, your singing, your music, I take no delight. I don't like the smell of, I will not accept, I will not look upon, I will not listen. I imagine receiving that word and think we would be utterly crushed and depressed, even angry. How can you be so unappreciative of what we are all doing to continue our worship of you, God? How can you say that our worship stinks? So if regular worship offered to God has the danger of stinking, what does God want? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now, I once saw a cartoon of two turtles. One says, Sometimes I like to ask God why poverty, famine, and injustice are around when he could do something about it. The other turtle says, you know what? I'm afraid God might ask me the same question. You see, church, true worship is never divorced from ethics. Worship and justice go hand in hand. The measure of how true our worship is, the measure of all our coming here for Holy Communion and tuning in every Sunday online, all of this, the measure of that will be seen in the way we live. Listen to the words of John Wesley. He says, What does it profit if a man says he has faith but not works? Can that faith save him? No. That faith which has not works, which does not produce both inward and outward holiness, which does not stamp the whole image of God on the heart and purify us as he is pure, that faith which does not produce, produce the whole of religion is not the faith of the gospel, not the Christian faith, not the faith that leads to glory. If you lay stress on this, you are lost forever. You build your house upon the sand. England in the 18th century was in terrible shape. One bishop, Bishop Berkeley, declared in 1738 that religion and morality in Britain had collapsed to a degree, and I quote, that was never before known in any Christian country. The Church of England back then had all the trappings of worship. The towering, towering cathedrals were bustling, there were daily worship services, and the sacraments were received regularly. 
Yet the church largely remains silent on the great injustices of the nation, chief amongst them the practice of slavery and slave trading. There were many other moral perversions in England at that time, such as attaching fireworks to bears and dogs and setting them off for sport. Many 18th century clergymen bred fighting roosters and had church bells rung to honour a local winner of these fighting roosters. Gambling was rife. Immorality was treated as a sport, from court masquerades to fornication in daylight in the village green or selling one's wife by auction in a cattle market. An astute judge asked, how does it come to pass that no sooner is a gambling den opened in any part of the kingdom than at once it becomes surrounded by a halo of brothels? Now, it was just into such a corrupt moral context that John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, were born. From 1739 to his death in 1791, John Wesley was indefatigable. His energy was prodigious. He got up each morning at four and preached his first sermon most mornings at five. He and his itinerant preachers divided each day into three equal parts, eight hours for sleep and eating, eight hours for meditation, prayer and study, and eight for preaching, visiting, and social labors. He organized hundreds of local Methodist societies after each place he visited. He established and kept an eye on a school in Kingwood, he opened the first free medical dispensary for the poor, a rheumatism clinic in London, and wrote a treatise on medicine. He prepared and preached at least 45,000 sermons, travelled more than 400,000 kilometres on horseback in all sorts of weather, night and day, up and down across England on roads that were often dangerous and sometimes impassable. During this time, he composed his commentary on the Bible verse by verse, wrote hundreds of letters and a daily journal from the year 1735 to the year before his death in 1791. He wrote some of the 330 books that were published in his lifetime. He composed English, French, Latin, Greek and Hebrew grammars, edited for the general education of his preachers and congregations many books which became the 50 volumes of his famous library. This cultured man, this keen theologian and esteemed intellectual warned his preachers that one could never be a deep preacher without extensive reading, any more than a thorough Christian. Every preacher was made a distributor and a seller of books and was expected to have mastered their contents. The Encyclopedia Britannica says of John Wesley in this regard that no other man in the 18th century did so much to create a taste for good reading and to supply with books at the lowest prices. That's not all. Thirteen years before the abolition committee was formed, Wesley published his Thoughts Upon Slavery, a graphic, vehement and penetrating treatise denouncing this vicious, horrid trade as a national disgrace. He kept up his attack on slavery until the end of his life, the last letter that he wrote being to William Wilberforce, the leader of the abolition committee. Wesley frequently wrote and spoke about the use and abuse of money and privilege. He wore inexpensive clothes and dined on the, on the plainest fare, not spending more than 30 pounds a year on his personal needs his whole life, regardless of what he earned. His clothes were spotless, his shoes always shined, and he never wore a wig. He supported fair prices, a living wage, honest and healthy employment for all. And there is no question that Wesley was more familiar with the life of the poor than any other public figure of his age. Constantly moving all over Britain, he could and did sense the mind of the people as no king or statesman ever was able to do. He ceaselessly called upon the rich to help the poor, and to his thousands of followers he gave this warning, Give none that ask for relief, relief an ill word or an ill look. Do not hurt them. He strongly campaigned against bribery and corruption at election times. And he railed against the scandal of sinecures in the Church of England. Sinecures are a paid position requiring little or no work 
by giving the holder status and financial benefit. He criticized aspects of the penal system and prisons, depicting prisons as nurseries of all manner of wickedness. He campaigned against the medieval, near medieval practice of medicine and for funeral reform. Now, in addition to Wesley's wide interests, concerns, and activities, which I have noted, it should be added to this list his practical interests in the potential uses for electricity, vocational training for the unemployed, raising of money to clothe and feed prisoners, to buy food, medicine, fuel, tools for the helpless and the aged, and the founding of a benevolent loan fund and the Strangers Friend Society. Now, it sounds like Wesley was a busybody. But Wesley understood Amos' message clearly. True worship is not just singing. It's not just coming for Holy Communion or believing the right things or saying the right things about God. True worship is transformative and ushers us out into the world to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. This is why social justice is a major emphasis of the Wesleyan tradition, and this is why Methodists the world over are renowned for our social action. This is why at the end of every service, if you notice on Sunday, when Reverend Niam comes up to dismiss us, we are sent forth into the world. The way we live for the other six days of the week are as equally important to God as the way we live on Sundays. Now, church, as you will hear later, I want to commend you, those of you who are tuned in right now, for faithfully attending our services week after week. Worship is important, and I want to commend you for devoting yourselves to the means of grace that we heard about last week. Scripture reading, fasting, prayer, fellowship, and so on. But if we are honest, we must ask ourselves. If we are to be true to Amos' words, we must ask ourselves, is our worship hand in hand with justice? If it is not, then we are in danger of offering God worship that He cannot accept, that stinks. The picture that the word justice many are most familiar with is that of a woman blindfolded, holding a set of balances or scales before her. Justice in this idea in the West is a static concept, a noun, describing the achievement of fairness and quality and equality and symbolized in a state of balance where all is at rest. Now, my brothers and sisters, the image of justice that Amos calls to mind is entirely different. Justice, according to Amos, is like a surging, churning, cleansing stream. All is in motion and commotion. Nothing is at rest. The same language is used in Judges 5.21 to describe the torrent of the Kishon River. This is the prophetic picture of justice. It is more like an onrushing torrent than a balanced scale. Justice is the expected response of God's people to what God has done for them. The prophet Isaiah once put his message in the form of a folk song. He sang about a friend who carefully tended a vineyard, digging it, clearing it of stones, building a watchtower in it, and hewing out a wine vat. But the vineyard, Isaiah said, produced only wild and worthless grapes. This, said the prophet, was a picture of Israel. Although God had done so much for this nation, when God looked for the fruits of justice and righteousness, they were not there, and the vineyard was destroyed. God's people doing justice is like a farmer's vineyard producing the right kind of grapes. Doing justice is the people of God responding to what God has done for them. And so when the prophet Amos speaks of justice, he speaks not of the realm of the theoretical, Rather, he leads us to those quarters of our city, Singapore, where the poor live, and he invites us to look into the eyes of the lonely widow, the hurting orphan, and the hungry beggar. Or he takes us next door to Block 350 or other rental flats in our neighbourhood, 
and introduces us to the young couple living in fear of being evicted. Or we may be led through a home for the aged where a lonely hand reaches out to be touched. I recall the way an old history professor defined poverty. He said, the poor are the ones who can never afford to have any bad luck. They can't get an infection because they don't have access to medicine. They can't get sick or miss their bus or get injured because they will lose their job if they don't show up for work. They can't misplace their pocket change because it's actually the only money they have left for food. They can't have their, their goats get sick because it's the only source of milk they have. On and on it goes. Of course, the bad news is everybody goes through a bad patch at one point in time or another. It's just that most of us have margins of resources and access to support that allow us to weather the storms that we face because we're not trying to live off $2 a day. Now, my brothers and sisters, COVID-19 has meant that we are unable to worship in church like how we are used to do. Perhaps it is a good time, therefore, to assess how true our pre-COVID-19 worship has been. If it has been true, then even COVID-19 will not stop our efforts to pursue justice and righteousness. Justice is not a luxury for good times. It is what God expects from us if our worship is true. Because, my friends, this is what God wants. Justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It seems like it's all too much. The world is so full of injustice. How can we change anything? People we know, perhaps we ourselves, are feeling injustice all year round. We know what it is like to expect a season of light, only to be overcome by darkness instead. Many companies, for example, business owners, have beat the lion of SARS, but have been mauled by the bear of COVID-19. Others have shut the door on economic ruin, thinking they are safe, only to have the fangs of cancer or some other disease pierce their flesh. Spare us the scolding, Amos, we want to say, nursing our snake bites and fumbling for the light switch. Sure, our festivals leave something to be desired, and our offerings are often quite paltry, but are we not simply doing what God has instructed us to do? We are all just doing the best we can. Some of you might be thinking, thanks, Pastor Ned. As if COVID-19, economic downturn, and a really tough 2021 looming is not enough, do you really have to come and preach this and ruin our day? Now, truth be told, church, I'm not here really to ruin anyone's day. Here's the truth of the gospel. To tell people how they ought to live does not constitute really the preaching of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. To announce to a people that its attitudes and structures are negative and inhuman and to tell it that things ought to be otherwise is hardly good news. It is a depressing statement of what most people are dimly aware of anyway. The witness of Christianity is only the announcement of good news if its primary statement concerns the here and now availability of the resources with which to revolutionize human society in the love of God. The witness of Christianity is only the announcement of good news if its primary statement concerns the here and now availability of the resources needed to change and transform human society in the love of God. And my brothers and sisters, if you look closely, that is precisely what Amos is offering us. I want you, in this last part, to focus on the words justice and righteousness. Let justice roll on like waters, righteousness like an ever-rushing torrent. Wherever this twofold conception is introduced in the Bible, we find consistently that we hear of it in relation to God. For example, in Psalm 99 verse 4, it is God who establishes justice and righteousness in the land. So Psalm 99 verse 4 says, The king in his might loves justice. 
You've, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Now elsewhere, in Hosea 2.19, for example, the Lord betrothes himself to the people of God in righteousness and in justice. In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, God appoints the king as his representative over the people in order that he may perform righteousness and justice in God's name. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and evermore. And the most important line, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The Bible tells us that justice and righteousness originate from God. Righteousness flows down from God and bids to flood the face of the earth through God's creation, humans. Justice and righteousness sweeps forth continually from God as a mighty, rushing river. When humans, sh when humans shrink, however, from the divine flood, when we refuse to let it spring forth into life, the waters are heaped up until they tumble down and destroy, and justice is made into judgment. This is the meaning of Amos' words. If you are reading this passage as, oh great, here comes God with more things for us to do to gain His approval, then you have completely and utterly missed the point. The vital connection is that God's righteousness desires to spread throughout the earth through human righteousness. And that man's destiny depends on whether or not we will submit to God's will or deny it. As C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Mere Christianity, Christ says, Give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think are innocent, as well as the ones that you think are wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall be yours. You see, church, what is ultimate, according to Amos in his iconic final lines, are justice, which rolls down like waters, and righteousness, which flows like an ever-flowing stream. The point in the end is not the melodiousness of our guitars or whether we have done our best to address the pressing issues of our day. In the end, the point is that justice and righteousness are God's good gifts which are cascading down on a parched creation. Our worship stinks when our lives are not plunged in the river of justice and righteousness of God. Worship without justice is false sentimentality, and justice without worship is fragile and temporal. And so when the people of God no longer separate our worship from our ethics, but when we offer every part of our lives to God willingly, when we expend our imagination and our energy both in worship and in advocacy, when we work to remove the discrimination built into the economic and legal systems, in finding ever new and more effective ways to take up the cause of the powerless, then justice will begin to roll through the land like waters, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It is the only way forward Amos is saying us today, Amos is saying to us today, to stand under that stream, to be baptized in it and be reborn, to bathe in it, to strip off our clothes and let us pelt us with the things that can come only from God. 
Guilt and shame are dead ends. What we need is a good spiritual cleansing, a good spiritual exfoliation. And so perhaps the prophet is not such a killjoy after all. Perhaps ruining our day is precisely what we need to hear so that we will come to the waters and be cleansed. If that's the case, then let it roll, let it roll, let it roll. Let justice roll on like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we hear your word to us this morning. Not to be content simply with the appearance of faithfulness, but to once again open our hearts and lives and hands to you to fall under that mighty stream, stream of justice and righteousness that comes from you alone. And having been bathed and cleansed and baptized in that stream, to be transformed into people of justice and true worship. God, help us. Help us not to use COVID-19 or the economic downturn or difficulties in our lives. Help us not to use these as obstacles to truly worshipping you both in church and out of church. Grant that our worship to you will always be a pleasing and fragrant, fragrant sacrifice. Empower us, Lord, to go out into the world to live, to love, and to serve for your kingdom's sake. Let it roll, Lord, in our lives. Let justice roll like waters. Righteousness like a rushing stream. We lift up our prayers, our worship, and our acts to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, the King of Justice. Amen. <laughs>